I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. We've got um, a few minutes before we start. You can also see Jill there. <laughs> Hi, Jill. <laughs> um, the, before we uh, start and we actually introduce Jill, just like to give you a quick um, publicity uh, plug on some of the future webinars that we've organized. You can all see them on that Hampshire branch page. The next one after today is on the 18th of June, and this is Clean Air Day. Now this one is very much joined with the Green IT Specialist Group, and you're looking very much at the, the concept of some of the technology that's going in to sort of try and measure and calculate the green air. So it's very, uh, I think the whole air situation has changed quite dramatically over the last three months. Now after that one, we're going on to the 24th, Wednesday the 24th. This is, and this is actually about the plastic in the oceans. I know earlier this week it was on Monday, it was the uh, International Ocean Day, but um, we've actually tied this in to the, the WED 2020. So that's Women in Engineering Day, which is actually um, on the 23rd, but we're having it the following day on the Wednesday, the 24th. Now, this is particularly links into, again, dealing with the environment. And this is a group of about 300 women that have got together uh, to sail around the world over a three year period, working in teams, I might add. Uh, so they're not all doing it at the same time. They had to stop, unfortunately, in April, about halfway around the world and halfway through the three year period. And they were taking samples, aiming through the most polluted areas of all the oceans and uh, identifying the pollution at the surface, about halfway down and at very much at the base as well. Now the teams were made up from women from the different countries, so the idea was the information would feed back and try and encourage us all to be a bit kinder to the uh, oceans, which is quite a sort of key issue. Now after that we have on the 16th of July, uh, this is linked with the e-learning specialist group, and we have a conference, the Inspire Conference, it's the 25th annual Inspire Conference, and this is looking for papers that are both to do with e-learning and also case study, which probably wouldn't have some sort of references, et cetera, with it, but case study for teachers at all levels and at university and how they've been using e-learning, particularly over this last three months and where they think it's going. We have two fantastic keynotes for this. Uh, one is Professor Liz Bacon uh, from Abate, and she's also past president of the BCS. And she's looking very much at how e-learning has changed recently over this last year in the UK and where she sees it in the future. And the other keynote is Professor Elaine Berkey um, from Finland. And she's actually looking at the situation in the Scandinavia, because again, they were much further ahead than the UK with the concept of e-learning originally. We're coming on to the 23rd of July. We have a straight webinar again. This coincides closely with the death of Jane Austen who's died and is buried in Winchester in Hampshire. And uh, this is actually say if Jane Austen was alive today, how she would effectively be using social media, et cetera. So again, this should be quite an interesting one. So at that stage, I'd like to sort of uh, welcome you and pass across on to Jill for the fantastic um, session that you've got. And that a lot of us actually desperately need to know more about Zoom. So Jill, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. Stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending today. The first thing that I'd like to do is just introduce myself very briefly. My name is Jill Clark. Um, I'll be your guide for the next hour. I'll also be available for asking questions uh, and question and answer session at the end. This presentation is available in your handouts at the end of the session. And the session is also being recorded. Consequently, yeah, that should be available after um, the IT group are able to upload it and make it available for you all who've attended the webinar today. My background is from 1979. Uh, yes, I'm quite old. I was a harmless COBOL programmer. And since then, I've done many things in the IT community. I'm currently working freelance 
as both a developer and a trainer. I teach technical training sessions. So I, I teach development, um, application development, software development, and web page development. Amongst the affiliations that I have, I'm on the British Computer Society Women's Group. I'm also a fellow of the Learning and Performance Institute. And if you go and have a look at the National Museum of Computing, which is based near Bletchley Park, where I live, um, you'll find the software gallery, which I developed along with Bob Jones. I work for a lot of very large companies through a training company called JBI. It's not my training company, I just work through them. And I've also just published a book, The Software Developer Guide, which is published by the BCS. Anyway, you'll be pleased to know that you haven't stumbled onto a dating website, so I'm not going to talk any more about me. We're going to get on with the presentation. If you can save the questions until the end, I'll be more than happy to answer questions. We're going to start off with a brief introduction, and we're going to have a look at the context for the webinar, why I'm doing this. We're then going to have a look at using Zoom for delivering training, and then at the end, approximately an hour from now, we'll have questions and close. First of all, the introduction. The whole point behind doing this webinar is a short in, a chat with Margaret a while ago, where I said that the training courses that I normally delivered as classroom based were now being delivered uh, virtually via Zoom or whichever other product my clients required. And Margaret said, gosh, that'd make a really interesting webinar. I'm hoping I don't let her down, and I'm hoping that the webinar will be useful for you. First of all, to clarify, this is not e-learning. What I'm not doing tonight is talking to you about designing and building e-learning courses. What we're looking at is the things that you can use in Zoom that will help you to port your class based classroom based training into virtual based training so proper e-learning as i'm sure you're aware is properly designed and planned it's got variety it's got interaction it's got all the things that i'm sure you're all very familiar with so this is not a session about designing e-learning what I'm trying to do is just make it nice and easy for people to transport some of the things that they did in classroom based learning into the interactive or virtual world. There are lots of different products that are available. I'm not going to particularly recommend a product. I'm covering Zoom because that's the one that Margaret and I were talking about. And it's also the one that seems to have gained the most traction since the coronavirus crisis began. However, there are many other products. I've put a link on the page here if you want to go and have a little look and compare the capabilities of the products. If you're in the happy situation of being able to choose which product you use, there's a few things that you should think about before you start. Ease of use and ease of setup are two of the big ones. I quite like Zoom, I find it very easy to use, it's very simplistic to set up, and people seem fairly happy to use it. Some of the other products can be a little bit more complex, but bear in mind they all have different costs and different capabilities. I would also urge you to check out the accessibility capabilities of a lot of these products. A majority of them, including Zoom, have the capability for closed captioning. It's not one of the things that I'm going to cover today, but if it's something that's important for your particular presentations in the future, look it up, it is available. So we're now going to talk about using Zoom to deliver some of this training. I want to be clear what sort of training I'm talking about. There are three main uses that we have for products like Zoom. We've got webinars, which is what we're doing today, obviously, and they tend to be one person talking to many people listening. Mostly they're lecture based. You can build in a little bit of interaction. I was thinking about doing this with interaction, but seeing as I'm talking about Zoom and we're using GoToWebinar, 
that didn't seem like a good idea. So this webinar is mostly going to be talking. I'm going to talk you through the way that you would use these things. I'm talking about the training. However, some of the things that we're talking about could well be useful in meetings as well. The whole point about what we're going to be looking at today is the interactivity and the capabilities of Zoom to make your presentation more interactive, more collaborative. Whilst I have done e-learning, I've developed it and I've also participated in it. A majority of the things that I do tend to be classroom based, or at least they did up until the coronavirus crisis. And the reason for this is that a lot of the subjects I teach are technical subjects, uh, software development, programming. I also do things like agile and scrum coaching, and we have a lot of interactivity, a lot of team based work. We use a lot of things like pair programming. If you're not sure what that is, ask me the question at the end and I'll talk you through it. But we use lots of things that we normally do face to face. And obviously porting this to a virtual session is obviously something that you have to put a little bit of thought into. So here's what I found. First of all, in classroom based training, I get a lot of feedback from body language, understanding how people are feeling, understanding how they're working with the things that I'm presenting, even whether or not they're very happy with the presentation or whether they're a little bit lost in space. So I get a lot of feedback from body language. There's lots of things that you can learn just by looking at people. Also, feedback is very instantaneous. I can say, have you got that? Is everyone clear with that? There it is, nice and instant feedback nods, shaking of the heads, even the people that don't like to speak in groups will usually be happy to nod their head or shake their head. So feedback is easier. So there's some things that we need to think about here. We need to think about getting feedback from our classes because we can't necessarily see their body language. I can't see any of you. If we can't see their body language, we need to find other ways of talking to them. So we can do things like quizzes or polls. Generally, when you're looking at doing things via e-learning or virtually, the wisdom is that you should have some form of interaction every three to five minutes. So that's every two or three slides, maybe. So I'm looking at doing quizzes, I'm looking at building polls, I'm looking at having whiteboards, I'm having people do annotations, giving them spaces that they can interact with me. Even the little icons for ticks and crosses. This is all the sort of feedback that we can use because we can't see their body language. Also, when I'm doing a lot of classroom based sessions, people work in groups. One of the key things we're going to talk about today are breakout rooms, how you can set up and use breakout rooms in Zoom. The good thing about them is they do allow you to wander from room to room. So once you've set up breakout sessions for your attendees, you can then go and have a look and talk to each group separately if you wish. They can also ask you for help if they want you to come and join them for any particular reason. So instead of being able to sit with my attendees, I can put them in breakout rooms. Alternatively, they can chat to me. People can have private chat or group chat. If people don't feel comfortable with talking to everybody, they can just chat to me personally in the chat room and I'll help them out on a one to one basis rather than everyone having to know what they're asking me. Other things, the focus. All of this interaction helps to keep focus going. Really, you want to make sure that you keep your presentations as short as possible. Distractions are much easier to find when you're doing something virtually. People will have their phone next to them or they might have an iPad or another computer open. They're probably going to have email messages popping up all the time. So in order to keep their attention, you've got to keep them interacting. You've got to make sure you keep the presentation short and give them practical work to do so that they've got something to engage in themselves, maybe also with other learners. The other thing that I had to find a way of doing in my classrooms 
is that occasionally I'll go off on a sidetrack. Someone will ask me a particular question, which necessitates me adding in a little bit of something just for that group or just for that topic. So one of the things we'll also talk about is using things like the whiteboard. So other, other ways of interacting. So in summary, we've got a whole different series of things that we can have a look at in Zoom in order to make interactivity and collaboration a reality for our presentations. Because I'm a programmer, I've got a very step-by-step -step logical way of doing things. So for each area that I'm going to talk about, I'll tell you what the setup is, I'll tell you where to find it on the screen, and then I'll tell you how you can interact with it. First of all, settings. Everybody I'm sure knows that Zoom can be downloaded for free. There is a free version of it. However, if you're going to be using it with any degree of consistency, you're going to need to get a paid for version. Now, I've got a professional version, cost me, including VAT, just under £150 for the year. They have got special offers on it, but it allows me to host web um, training and it also allows me to use a lot of the facilities that we're talking about here. It also uh, allows me to run sessions for more than 40 minutes. So that's a key thing for when you're training. The other thing to mention is that there are two different um, areas that you can put settings in on Zoom. On the desktop of your computer, there's a little icon with a video camera. OK, that's the Zoom application. But you can also get to Zoom from a login on the web interface. And all of the settings that we're talking about are on the web interface. So when we're talking about it, you sign in to the Zoom web interface, go onto the internet, go to Zoom login and login, you're there. You're going to go to account management, you're going to go to account settings down here. And then over on the right hand side, you've got meetings. And over here, all of the settings that we're going to talk about will appear. So everything that we talk about is from the settings in account management account settings. And a quick orientation of the screen in case some of you haven't used Zoom for a while or perhaps haven't had a chance to look at Zoom at all. I use Zoom on a desktop computer or on a laptop. Please bear in mind that other people might use Zoom on a tablet or they might use it on a mobile phone. There are lots of different platforms that people can use Zoom on. When you see the screens that I'm going to show you, they're going to be on a laptop type screen. One of the first things that I like to do is make sure that whenever I'm using the training, I have my screen laid out in the same way every time. That way, I haven't got to spend time going, oh, hang on a minute, let me just find out where I've put it. It slows the training down and it breaks up the dialogue. When we're talking about the areas of the screen, down at the bottom of the screen, down here, is where the toolbar will normally sit. However, if you're sharing your screen, that toolbar moves to the top of the screen. I also like to have my participants on the right and the chat underneath, just so I can see if anyone's trying to talk to me. If someone does try to chat to you while you're doing a sh screen share, then one of these little message thing, uh, one of these little icons will flash at you. So you'll actually be able to see that someone's trying to communicate with you. Another small thing that I like to do is if I'm going to be talking to people directly, then I like to put my participants underneath the camera so that when I get the urge to talk to a person, I'm still facing in the right direction rather than talking to somebody down in the corner like this which doesn't give a good impression for the other people that are listening. 
The first thing we're going to talk about is annotations. Annotations are just ways that you can interact with people. They can draw on your screen, they can give you messages, they can write things. So, first of all, there's an annotation setting in the settings, the account settings that we saw earlier. And when you look at the screen, when you're sharing, in order to do annotations, you must be sharing, you'll see the annotate button. When you click on that button, then on your screen, you'll get a little toolbar. I've made it a little bit taller up at the top here. Now, there's a few things here that are helpful. There's free format drawing. There's a stamp where you can have a little arrow or a heart shape or a symbol of some kind. Spotlight is just a, a bright sort of flash type thing that's attached to your cursor. So you can move your cursor and make it nice and clear where the cursor is moving to. You can change the colors. You can see in the little screen here that I've highlighted, I've drawn a circle around one of the plants on the wall. So there's lots of different things here that you can do. Down at the end, there is a little place where you can save your annotations as well. This is a really useful tool. It'll allow me to save the items that I've drawn on the screen, which I could then potentially email to people later on. So if I was doing some mind mapping or if we were coming up with other ideas, we could save the ideas and then email them to everybody afterwards. It's saved automatically in the Zoom folder on your machine and it's saved under the date and time of the meeting so you can immediately find it. A couple of things. I find it useful if I'm doing annotations to have one of these pen and tablets. I find it a little bit easier because otherwise you're going to have to draw or use your mouse and depending on how people are working it can be a little bit difficult to control the mouse when you're trying to write or when you're trying to do fine drawing. So that's the first thing. I find it useful to have a pen and tablet in order to do my drawing. So some form of drawing tool. Also, I like to have set the space up beforehand. Here, for instance, I've saved a little bit of um, code from a web page that I was working on. And what I allow, allow people to do is bring this up full screen, and then I can ask people questions about it. I could ask them to find where the bug is and underline it, or I could ask them to highlight any lines of code that they wanted me to explain in more detail. This way, they not only interact with me, but they also have um, a function as something to do other than listening to me. They have to read the code in order to answer my question. Other things that I might do is I might have a blank slide with a key point in the middle and then ask them to add little comments or messages or ideas to that blank space. If you want people to write on a space, give them the space to write. The next thing is breakout rooms. Again, there's a setting for breakout rooms, so you need to make sure that that's on before you start working with breakout rooms. You do need a paid for subscription to do this. Uh, this isn't available on the free ones. And when you look at the bottom of the screen, the toolbar at the bottom of the screen will have breakout rooms on it. So when I click breakout rooms, the first thing it asks me to do is how many rooms would I like? You have a maximum of 50 different rooms. So that should be quite a lot. And, you know, when you consider that the number of people as a general rule would be 100 unless you have a more expensive paid for um, subscription. So you have to tell it how many rooms would you like? Also, whether you want it to break the participants out for you automatically, it will just throw them in one at a time, or whether you want to manually assign people to use the rooms. 
please assume that I've clicked on manually for this next bit. Then you click on create rooms. Over here on part two, you can see that it will automatically time the breakouts for 30 minutes. It will give a countdown before it closes the breakout rooms automatically. And even after I've said I'm going to manually do it, you could still break the part, you could still break the participants out automatically. All of these options are available via an options button at the bottom of the breakout dialog. You'll see it in a moment. If I said that I want to assign people manually, it'll give me a breakout room. And when I click on assign, it'll list all the participants and I just click on the ones that I want to go into the room. So what I'll end up with is I'll end up with all of the different breakout rooms. I can add a room and then add more participants and it will just list all of the rooms with all of the participants in. After I've got it set up, I can then click on open all rooms. I would have liked it to have said open all hours, but I'm sure the BBC's got that title copyrighted. Anyway, open all rooms, we'll get all of the rooms started. After that, from a host's point of view, it changes to this where you can close all of the rooms. Okay, so after you've opened them, it'll then change the dialogue so that you can close. In the meantime, from the attendees' point of view, the attendees are going to get a little message saying, did you want to join this breakout room? If they say join, then the screen for them will change. And what they will be in is something that looks exactly like a normal Zoom meeting. So it's as if they've split out into another Zoom meeting. The difference between using breakout rooms and having separate Zoom meetings, first of all, if you're in a Zoom meeting and you want to go to a different Zoom meeting with the same subscription, then you'll have to close the one down that you're in. So if you did it as separate Zoom meetings, you'd have to close one down and restart another one. With breakout rooms, people can split out into separate little meetings, but then at the end of it, they've still got a connection to the main meeting, which they can come back to. They have the option of leaving the meeting, and they also have the option of asking for help. So if they're in the breakout and they want the host to participate with them, they can ask for help. When they ask for help, as the host, you're going to get, uh, sorry, as an attendee, you're going to get a message first to invite the host. If you click on that, as the host, you're going to be asked to join a particular breakout room. You get the choice of joining the breakout room or saying later. Now, if you've got several breakout rooms, you might be in one breakout room already when this message pops up. In which case, say later, and then the attendees of the breakout room that's asked for your help will get a short message to say, you're already helping someone else, please try again. Okay, I always like to warn people beforehand that this is going to happen. So when we do the breakout rooms, I'll tell them, you're going to get a message if you ask for help. If it comes back and said, I'm helping someone else, then please wait five minutes and try again, just so that they're aware of what's happening. If you do go into another breakout room, then it's just as if you're in an ordinary Zoom meeting. So all of the things that you would normally have done are still there. So you can do all of the annotations and all the rest of the things that you might normally have done in a Zoom session. At the end of it, you can leave the breakout room or the host can close the rooms. Either way, you can jump out of your breakout session. And what that will do is, assuming that you don't leave the meeting as a whole, 
it will then just take you back to the main Zoom session where you can then get everyone together and perhaps ask them to do a screen share of their own work so that they can see what they've done. If I'm going to get people to do the annotations that we talked about earlier and save the annotations so that they can share those with other teams, then I always like to give them a presentation similar to this one to read beforehand so that they know what they need to do in order to save annotations and in order to share the screen. The next thing is chat sessions. You've got chat sessions in here. However, as I said, I didn't want you to use one lot of chat sessions while I talked about another. So these are the Zoom chat sessions. There are actually quite a few settings that you might want to set up for chat. The two that I would suggest that are vital, the top one is to allow a chat room in the first place. The second one, private chat, you may or may not want to allow this because what this allows attendees to do is chat privately to other attendees. Depending on the group that you're working with, the topic or how you're going to present it, you may want to stop them doing this um, because it can be a sidetrack. They can be sitting there chatting away to someone else and not looking at the presentation, etc. But you're all experienced trainers, I'm sure, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail of the psychology, uh, psychology on that. There is also an option down at the bottom here for auto saving chats. So at the end of a session, it will automatically save the chat into the Zoom folder on your machine with the date and time that the meeting was held. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little chat icon. When you click on that on your main screen, if you've left it in the default layout, then over on the right hand side, the chat screen will appear. In order to use the chat, really simple, I'm sure you've done it a hundred times, type in your message, set who you want it to go to, unless you specifically pick a particular participant, it will go to everyone, and then hit enter. Simple as that. The next thing I want to chat to you a little bit about is file examples. I find it's even more important to give people examples of things. Normally in a classroom-based environment, I'd give people sample answers to code that I wanted them to develop. But if I'm working virtually, I like to give them additional answers. I also like to give them the option of me doing a demonstration of how to get to that answer. I give them the option of recording it. When you're looking at a Zoom screen, if you look at the participants, then each participant has got a little button next to it with more on it. You can click on that and give them recording rights. So as well as giving file examples, I like to give live demonstrations to show people the step-by-step -step process of how to get to the end result of a practical exercise. I allow them to record it so that they can go away and watch it through a few times if that helps them. But setting up files, you've got a couple of options here. You can directly copy a file from your computer into the chat area and people can download it from there. The problem with this is that in order for people to see that, they need to be actually an active participant. So you can't set this up before everybody gets in to the chat. OK, they need to be an active participant and then you drop this into the chat. If you want to set your files up beforehand, then you can use one of the other options that's available, such as Dropbox or Google Drive. There's a few different options. So you're going to make sure that you've got file transfer allowed. 
in the chat area, there's a file button. On the file button, you can then select the way that you want to deliver the files for people to take from you. I will just warn you, I have had a couple of problems with this. The reason I want to mention it is that one of the clients that I work with, their attendees don't have their own Zoom accounts. They use a company Zoom account. And this Zoom account is set up with default options. And one of the default options is that they can't have files. So for one of my clients, I do need to set it all up beforehand and let them use the Dropbox or the Google Drive to get that. But for preference, I like to give them the files one at a time before each practical exercise or before each demonstration. So in the chat area, I'm clicking on file and I'm clicking on your computer. It then gives me the standard file dialog. I select the file, click on open, and then it opens that file in the chat. In order for the attendees to use it, all they need to do is just click on the attachment and it will open for them. Okay. Do bear in mind what I said about some Zoom accounts having limited capability for reading attachments, though. Please bear that in mind. Again, I warn the students beforehand, if you have any trouble with it, let me know, we'll find another way. The next thing, quizzes. I like to add in some quizzes for some of the um, courses that I do. I also quite like to have little polls that I get people to fill in at the beginning. In a normal classroom based environment, I get people to introduce themselves and also to say who they are, what they do, whether they've got previous experience or not. One of the things I found with virtual training is that people are much more reluctant to speak. I've had people that I've met before that I know are very chatty in a meeting or in a classroom environment. And yet in a virtual environment, they very seldom speak. So in order to avoid people having to do the, hello, my name's Jill and I don't know anything about this subject, I like to do the polls at the beginning so that people can just click on those anonymously and I'll get an idea of who's already covered the topic and who hasn't from a quick 30 second poll instead of people having to introduce themselves. Again, there's a setting for it. Make sure you've got the polling set up. I would like to point out that in order to see polling, it must be a scheduled class. I sometimes start an ad hoc meeting. In other words, one that's not scheduled. I just press on the start meeting now. And if I start a meeting like that, I don't get polls on my toolbar at the bottom of the screen. It must be a meeting that you've previously scheduled in order to have polling. A lot of the work we're going to look at on polling can be done in two ways. You can add a poll from inside the meeting as an ad hoc sort of poll. But I quite like to build the polls beforehand, save them on a meeting template, and then use that template for my polls. That way I don't have to recreate them every time. I'll show you both techniques here. You can choose whichever one's most appropriate. So I've scheduled my meeting. I've started my meeting. When I start my meeting, I can click on the polls button. When you want to add a new poll, it will throw you automatically into a browser and into the web interface. So you don't actually add the polls from within the meeting, even though you might click the button from within the meeting, it will still put you into the web interface. A couple of 
uh, limitations, you can have a maximum of 25 polls for a single meeting. And each meeting can have a max, each poll, sorry, each poll can have a maximum of 10 questions. That's still a total of 250 questions per meeting. That would be an awful lot to get through. So when I schedule my meeting, if I scroll down to the bottom, you can see that there's an area that says you have not created any polls yet. If you went in and built the poll when you scheduled the meeting, then you press add here. If you wanted to create the poll ad hoc from within the meeting, then you click on the polls button at the bottom of the toolbar. So either from inside the meeting or when you schedule the meeting. Both of those will allow you to create a new poll. Let me just say that when you schedule a meeting and create a poll, you do get the option to save the meeting as a template. I like to do this because when I save the meeting as a template, it saves the polls with the meeting template. So next time I schedule the same course, all I have to do when I schedule the meeting is open the template and the polls or quizzes are already there for me. So here we go. We're going to add a question. You'll get a blank template and the blank template asks you, what's your question? What's your title? Will the answers be anonymous? And then you put in a series of answers. You can also specify whether it's a single answer or multiple choice answers. Once you've done the first question, you can add another question. So you'll have this template again, another question, another set of possible answers, add another question another set of possible answers and so on. When you're finished, you can click on save. So you're going to have something like this. Here's my poll for what are your existing React skills? React is one of the courses that I teach. And what I'm asking people to do is multiple choice answers to how they would ex assess their existing skills. So I set it up here in the template. This is what it's going to look like in the quiz. One of the things that you'll notice is if you don't use all the possible answer options, they will be left there. If you want to avoid that, you can click on the answer and you can delete the answer line so that you won't get these empty ones. Of them. OK, so I've set up all of my questions. When I'm in the meeting and I'm ready to launch one of my quizzes or polls, I can again click on the poll. It will then give me a set of options. There's a little drop down button here, which will list all of the polls that I have for this meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can select the one that I want to use and then I can launch the poll that starts it running. What I can then do is watch the poll in progress. And as people fill it in, I will actually see it live running and I will see the number of people that have answered from the number of attendees in the meeting. I'll also have up in the top corner here a little timer that shows me how long this poll has run for. After a specified amount of time or when everyone's filled it in, whichever soonest, you can end the poll. If you're an attendee viewing a poll, 
then what's going to happen is it will automatically pop the poll up on your screen. It's very faint on here. You can't really see it very well, but that says poll in progress. And the attendee is expected to fill that in. Everything else is grayed out while the attendee fills that in. So that's what the attendee sees. This is what the host sees, as we saw on the previous screen. Once the poll or the quiz has finished, you're then going to get the option to share the results with the rest of the attendees at the meeting. So I'm going to get a screen that looks something like this. It will be all filled in. It will show me the percentage of people that answered each question. And I can share the results so that everyone can see them. Here's what it looks like when I'm sharing the results. You'll notice at the bottom here, I can stop sharing the results. If I press on poll and I've already done the poll, it will show me the results. Hence, I can relaunch the poll, which clears down those answers and gives you the chance to fill it in again. This is quite useful if you want to gauge how well people have taken in a topic. So you can ask them beforehand, please assess your current capability and then use the same poll at the end, please assess it now to see if the percentages have changed. Hopefully they have. There are other types of quizzes or polls that you might want to look at. If you think about your Zoom screen, in the participants area, there are some icons that people can use. And these are really quick. You can ask them a verbal question and then get them to click either yes or no. That yes or no will come up against their name in the participants area. The catch 22 with this type of poll, however, is that everybody can see what everybody else has voted. Okay. These icons can also be quite useful for getting interaction about how we're doing in terms of do you want me to go faster, do you want me to go slower? You've got icons for those two things. You've got the thumbs up or thumbs down. You've got a round of applause. You've got the coffee break. Now, I would usually put that next to my name while we're having the coffee break so that people know that there's time out. But you can also put the time away thing. I tend to put the clock for longer breaks, such as lunchtime. And you can also clear all of the icon interactions in the participant area. Even quicker than that, at the bottom of people's screens are these brief reactions. And these reactions are literally a round of a, a wave yeah, or a thumbs up. OK, so just a couple of quick reactions to make sure people are still there. Is everybody with me? Yep, we're good. The last of the topics to talk about is whiteboards. There's a setting for it, again, in the usual account settings, make sure it's switched on. You can also make sure that you've allowed the saving of the whiteboard. If you want to save the interactions, it's really important that you allow that. So you're going to go to screen share. And one of the options in screen share is to share the whiteboard. Select whiteboard and share. And this thing gives you a little whiteboard with all of the same interactions that you had for the annotations. So people can write, they can draw, they can save what they've been doing. These are quite useful. One of the things I would say about this is that when I do a screen share, I usually share my whole screen. This is because it saves me having to keep swapping backwards and forwards amongst the separate applications that I'm using. I tend to have my code window open, my presentation window open, my Zoom window open. I have a drawing application open and I share the whole screen 
so that I can just maximize whichever one I need rather than having to share something else each time. Because again, it breaks the dialogue up, gives, gives you an unnecessary gap in proceedings while you work out where you are and what you need to share. So you can use the whiteboard and you can use the annotations that everyone uses. I like to have a separate drawing program. It could be as simple as paint, but I like to have a simple separate drawing program that I use. And that way I can share it on the whole screen instead of having to go to whiteboard, use the whiteboard, and then stop sharing the whiteboard to share something else. So I can just flip between one or the other. That way I'm leaving the whiteboard up in the background. I've gone through that information fairly quickly in order to give us some time for questions. I'm hoping that the presentation has been helpful. And even if going through all of that information hasn't stuck in one go, the presentation is available afterwards. You can use this presentation. You can share this presentation with other people that you work with. But I would ask you please to keep my copyright on it. Give credit where credit's due. So you're free to use this if you wish. I've added in my email address if you want to email me any questions. And I've also put in a couple of links to my company's uh, websites. One of them is for teaching, that's Talking Bear, and one of them is for development, that's Coding Bear. I'm going to close the presentation. And then we're going to make it available so that people can ask questions. Thank you very much, Jill. This was fantastic. We're amazed. <laughs> okay. So much all there. Yes, yeah. Yeah. The there is rather a lot of information in there. So the next thing then is does anyone have any questions is there anything that you'd like me to go through now i'm just going to stop this presentation running and close that down so we've got 10 minutes for questions and answers there's no questions so far coming up on the chat ones um the i think probably if we could for the attendees, can you uh, signal raise a hand? Oh, I have a, a note from Matt who said I'd like to say thank you. Well, thank you very much for listening, Matt. It's very kind of you to attend. I hope it's been useful. Has anyone got any, any questions they'd like to raise? If we let... Something flashed up, oh, it's you, isn't it? Yeah, if we let everybody... The attendees will have full audio control. So, although try not to all speak at once, then. Hi, it's I Jane here. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi. Um, I was just wondering how you let participate participants do the annotation. I thought you could only do that if you were the person sharing the screen. Uh, no, the the participants can do that as well. So if, if when you're sharing your screen, if the participants move to the top of the screen, there's an annotations option that they can use as well. Oh, I didn't know that. I've, I've used it myself. But I didn't know we could make that available to others. Thank you. Great presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. That's very kind of you. I've got a question. Hi, Cornelia. How are you? I'm good. Um, I've typed it in, but uh, I guess no one noticed it. Can you recommend a good, simple introduction to Zoom for non-technical people? Maybe a video or something? There's, oh, as with everything nowadays, there's a mass of stuff on YouTube. However, I find that the Zoom help pages are brilliant. They actually take you through step by step exactly what you need to do. You can print them off 
uh, so that you can make your own little guidebook if you want them. And also, I like to provide a series of hyperlinks to the pages to participants that are attending any Zoom courses. And I'll say, OK, if you haven't done annotations, look at this page. Uh, if you haven't used chat, look at this page. So I find that the Zoom help actually is really helpful. Yeah. I've, they also have channels on YouTube. Um, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen all the ones on YouTube and I wondered if you, uh, because a lot of people um, just need help downloading Zoom as well. Okay. Um, the other thing that I can do, if you would like me to, is I can put together um, a short PDF that you can make available on the web page if you want. Oh, that would, would that be help? Great. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I've got right. a bit of time later this week and next week. I well, can put that together for when you. When you can, and I'll put it on the BCS Women website. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'll do that. Thank you. Thanks. That's all right. That's You're welcome. welcome. Thanks. That'll be great. Thank you, Jill. I'll circulate that round as well. We've got various okay. people with their hands. Um, A A E. Yes, um, I I asked a few questions in the chat. I guess you're not seeing them. So uh, no, I missed well, that. All I'm seeing in chat is the agenda. Let oh, okay. So after the agenda, I've asked questions. Maybe other people are having the same problem. I'm not sure. Anyway, ah, I see they they've actually gone into a separate area that we have called questions, which we weren't seeing. So I've just brought that up now. Oh, so you've seen the questions. That's amazing because I think there'll be lots of questions from others as well. My main question is this: when we do the share screen and people can annotate as well, can they do yeah. other things on your computer as well and get access to other things that like click on yeah. things and share as well? No, they do, they don't get access to use my computer. Um, I understand. I've never used it um, because I would object to people being able to use my computer. But you can, in some products, give control to people so that they can control your computer. But I've never used it in Zoom, nor would I use it in any other um, application. Mm -hmm. And Joe, um, the other question I had was that um, it, in my case, I'll be discussing quite confidential information about patients and mm -hmm. about sensitive issues how safe is zoom okay they brought out a new version of zoom which was mandatory from the 30th of may and they've actually added a lot of additional security to it so that's the first thing because the when the whole crisis started zoom wasn't as secure as we might have wanted it to be so first of all, they've improved it in the product itself since then. But also, there's a few things that you can do when you're scheduling. First of all, make sure that you enable the waiting room. What the waiting room does is it means that when people try to join, the host has to actually allow them in. So you get to vet who comes into your session before they're allowed in. It also means you can kick people out. Okay. So enable the waiting room. That's the first thing. The second thing is you can specify that a password must be needed in order to join. Mm -hmm. So you can do that. Um, if you've got a recurring meeting, mm -hmm. it's better rather than setting it up as a recurring meeting, to actually schedule separate meetings each time. Again, that improves security. Mm -hmm. Right, that's as far as I'm willing to go in terms of what I know for sure about Zoom security. If you want yeah. any more information, then I'm afraid you're going to have to look at the Zoom help pages um, because I'm not qualified to talk any deeper in terms of security. That's been really helpful, Jill. And I just want to say what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for everything you've done tonight. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you to say. I'm, I'm looking at some of these other questions and I see that Christopher says, why is this not on Zoom? It's exactly what I asked Christopher. Anyway, moving on. <laughs>
partly the answer of that one is it's um, we set it up with the BCS standard ones. So, uh, yes. but I think maybe I've got a feeling we're going to be asking Jill if she could do another one later on, on Zoom maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe so. <laughs> I'm very given that I started doing this webinar after a, a, a casual chat with you, Margaret. I'm very cautious about having casual chats with you in the future. <laughs> Right. I'm just having a look at a few of these uh, other questions that we've got. We've actually got loads of questions. Oh, Elena said thank you. Thank you very much. OK, let's have a little look. I'm, I'm going to start from the top and go through the list. Um, AE, we've just spoken about security, so I'm assuming that we've had a, a little uh, session on answering all of your ones. So let's see what else we've got. So here you said that some of the slide wasn't visible. I'm sorry, we didn't get this question earlier on. Did it, I, so here I hope that that were that you've actually. Oh no, you've left. Okay, so here is left. But the slides are actually fully visible. Um, were on they? The, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I had the same the issue as well. Sorry. I I had the same issue. I couldn't see the full slide. Yeah, I did it to fit the screen. Same. It was oh, okay. the slide was missing. Ah, okay. Was it by any chance the top right hand corner? It was the right hand side. It was okay. the far right hand side. But I it, think it was the information. I, yeah, I think that what's happened is when I'm using GoToWebinar over on the right hand side there's a small window that tells me that the volume control is going and that the presentation is still running and how many people are in and that was visible on my screen and i think that what has happened is that it hid some of the presentation from you which is a shame had i known that i would have closed that down that'll teach me <laughs> that's the great thing about learning isn't it you never stop Okay. Right. So I'm I'm sorry to the people that that had a problem seeing the presentation. Um, as AE said, though, you could resize it so that you could see the whole presentation in a smaller window, perhaps. Okay. Who else have I got? Oliver. Oliver, you've asked me some questions. Oh, um, look, the first one's already been answered, and then I realised with the poll that it is actually you can do it beforehand. So sorry. I no, no, that's fine. Yeah, but thank you, Jill. That was absolutely brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you. You're very kind. Who else have we got? I'm just having a little look. Natalia, you said thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending. That's very kind. Andy Clark, no relation. Quick question about quizzes. Right, let me see. Just going to, Andy, I'm just going to see if I can. Right, quick question about quizzes. Uh, multiple choice only. Yes, at the moment they are. Yeah. So single choice or multiple choice, but it's a question and answers option. So when you have a question and a selection of answers, you can have one single answer or multiple answers, but they're not um, drag and drop or any of these other uh, smart types that you might see in other products. Right, Abigail asks, if I'm systematic about adding interaction, I have to be honest with you, Abigail, I'm, I'm not absolutely precise on it. Because I teach technical subjects, sometimes when I'm presenting um, a new code concept, it's not quite the three to five minutes that I would like. But what I always do is I talk a little bit, I show them some code, I let them try the code out and then I give them some practical work to do. And when I'm showing them the code, uh, I get them to underline or highlight or as we were talking with annotations. 
but sometimes when I'm presenting the particular topic, it might take me more than five minutes to present a particular topic, but I try and keep it as short as possible. David said thank you. Thank you, David. That's very kind of you. What else have we got? Uh, Peter and uh, Peter asked about do they need to use the paid for version? Uh, no, they don't. As long as the host has got a paid for version, that's okay. The attendees don't need a paid for version. And David said, very interesting session. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. That's very kind of you to attend. Kathy, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> Gregory said you needed this weeks ago. Ah, oh, I needed my back to the future thing, didn't I? My Star Trek beam me up capability. I'm sorry. I'll try and I'll try and be faster next time. On the bright side, you can share this, so maybe it will help your colleagues. Chris, Chris had a question. Um, yeah, which got, yeah. Can the participants in the breakout use the whiteboard too? Say again, Margaret. I think it says here, uh, Chris, is Chris online? Uh, you're saying can the participants in the breakout room use the whiteboard also? Uh, with the annotations. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, presentation, Jill. Uh, a, a good one. Uh, Thank you. No, I was just curious that the uh, whether whether when people are in the breakout rooms can they actually use the uh, the facilities that the host can use, especially the whiteboard. Uh, yeah, they can share their screens. They can, they can. It's just as if they were in a separate Zoom session. The difference is they can, they, they just still got the connection back to the main meeting. I, I understand from what I've, I've seen some of the videos of the, uh, the um, Zoom's uh, website. I was just curious that if, if can I have recordings of the various breakout rooms, or is just the host recording only? Say, for example, when you're in the breakout room and you have interaction, can the mm -hmm. people in the interactions, uh, interactions be recorded also, or is just the host presenting that's recorded? I'll be perfectly honest with you, Chris. I've never tried it. I've never tried recording a, a breakout session. Um, I'm trying to remember what the screen looks like in a breakout session. Bear with me just a second, Chris. Okay, I'm going to have you. a quick look. Mm. I can't see it offhand in the from what, I, from what I can gather, it was that I, the host must yeah, go I, into the interaction, the breakout room for the recording to, to come into effect. But if you have many breakout rooms, it's kind of a kind of loss of the uh, interaction if you don't have it recorded also. But from what I can gather, the, the host needs to be hovering around each of the rooms to have it recorded. Or the other alternative uh, is, is to have many hosts or many people who can actually be hosts or proxy hosts to actually go in there. So I was, I was just curious because I think a lot of the exchanges could be lost if the if the recordings are not there and just the host delivering the content and not actually having any interactions. You know, it, yes. yeah. sorry about I, that. For, for the long, long I don't window. know. I, I'm I'm sorry, Chris, but as I say, I haven't actually used it myself, so I can't really answer yeah, no, this one with any degree of confidence. I can't see why you couldn't record it, but what I've always got people to do in breakout rooms is to have uh, like a, a, a screen share. So mm. if you think about the slide that I had, 
that was blank with a, a little idea in the middle of it. Yeah. I've always given people um, a little slide deck to work with in their breakout rooms with questions to fill in, and then they've saved each one of those. And right. that's how I've got them to record what they've done, as opposed to recording the discussions. Right. Okay. So, Thank you. So, Thank you. so I don't I don't know about video recording. Right. Right. No, no, it's fair, but yeah, fair do. It's, it's, it's something that I was just, just wondering because when you when you send them in when you assign them into breakout rooms, they are almost left their own device and, and without a, a butterfly hovering around them. They, they, they are, the other option I can think of is you have a scribe, but the scribe doesn't actually do the recording as such. No, that's true. One of the things that I'll sometimes do is when I assign people to breakout rooms, I'll get one of the people to be in charge of presenting it back to everyone else. Right. So um, I don't teach in college or university. I teach at big companies and right. they tend to be used to giving presentations to other people. Mm -hmm. um, so they're pretty good. I've, I've not had one that didn't do what I asked. Let's put it that way. Um, okay. So it might be useful to assign someone to the scribe role or assign someone as the chair or something like that. But okay. I'm sorry, okay. I can't give you a full no, answer. No, no, no. It's just sharing, sharing ideas and sharing practices, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Keith no, Taylor here. Could I, could I just say something? Idea. That's the next question. Uh, Keith Taylor. Oh, Keith. Yeah, I was just going to say about the recording, um, yeah. most of the recording is done on your local computer, isn't it? So yes. you could only record what's what's coming in front of you you can't record something that's happening in another breakout room that you haven't got access to at the moment so if you're in a certain breakout room you might be able to record that one but you couldn't record anywhere else's could you because you haven't got a, a feed from that well that's very true that's very true i i kind of assumed that chris was talking about the people in the breakouts recording yeah. it locally was was what i was yeah, yeah, that, you that are. Yeah, question that's right. I heard. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on that. One. No, no, that, that was the that was the version I had in mind. Thank you. Okay. I do I do have another question, which is, if you change the setting while you're in a meeting, so you change, everyone's got the access to the whiteboard, for example. Uh, does that setting then carry on to another meeting that you might start? Is it a kind of global setting, or is it just a local setting? No, they're global settings. Okay, so you, you can remember that you, once you've changed it to anyone can access the whiteboard, then every meeting you run has got that. Yeah, so you'll have to you'll have to set it back again afterwards if you don't just want it for a one-off. Okay, thank you. We okay. have another question um, from uh, David. Has Zoom more features than GoToWebinar? Say hmm. again. Uh, David, are you on? Has Zoom more features than GoToWebinar? I can't hear you, Margaret. You broke up on that last one. I only heard the word webinar at the end. Okay. Has Zoom more features than GoToWebinar? Ah, has it got more features than GoToWebinar? No, I don't think it has. Um, a lot of the products that are available, WebEx, GoToWebinar, uh, Skype, Zoom, they all have very, very similar features. Um, the slideshow that I gave you had um, a link to a page that compares all the features of all of the different presentation products. So if there's a particular thing that you must have, then it's best to, to go and check that comparison grid. I can only say that if I have a choice, I prefer Zoom because it's very easy to use. It's very easy to set up. Um, which are things that I have not found with some of the other products. So Zoom would be my personal favourite, but sometimes I have to use whatever my clients want, which might not be <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> but uh, these capabilities that we've been looking at are, are in the vast majority of the products. And I've used um, Adobe Connect, I've used WebEx, I've used Skype, I've used Microsoft Teams. Um, obviously, go to meeting and go to webinar. So 
they're available in those ones. I'm just looking through the list of questions. I seem to have a lot of questions still that we haven't got to. Please bear with me. I think there's a final question from Stuart. Um, can a PA organise my Zoom events or do I need to organise them myself? Stuart, are you on? Uh, well, Stuart, I, I think if you give your PA the logins, etc., then yes, of course they can. Whoever's got the login for the Zoom setup will have the capability of organising it. So. Um, I would imagine the answer would be yes. I think that there's a, I think we've now gone through the questions and this is any last one. Which case I think I like to thank Jill very much and uh, ask everybody if you can unmute mute so you can actually um, say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Goodbye. Have a good Bye. evening.